Okay, sweet. Well, um, Casey, welcome to the show. Uh, why don't you give us a brief interview? Oh, Scott, give us a brief overview of uh, what you're doing and, and kind of a little bit of on your background. Oh my gosh, what am I not doing is probably a better question, but I, I promise I will try and be as brief as possible. So uh, I have a company called Finding Next. Uh, after I left the Chamber of Commerce, no Chamber of Commerce most of my career, um, Finding Next, and I have been uh, really doing a lot of work in community ecosystem work. So I, I work with communities and organizations, economic development organizations, chambers of commerce across the U.S. that are trying to figure out, um, you know, pr productive community ecosystems around supporting um, businesses uh, and supporting growth uh, and shared growth. And so I do a lot of really fun stuff around that. Second, in Durham, really my only real work in Durham still is um, I have been for the last two or three years working with an organiz nonprofit organization called Made in Durham, um, which is basically Durham's talent development pipeline work. So it's, it's this high level nonprofit system work that works with all the programs in Durham that help youth between the ages of 14 to 24 um, get ready for edu their education to career experience and end up uh, with a, a good working, um, you know, livable wage job in Durham. Um, and so we don't really don't do the programmatic piece. We work with all the other programs who are doing that work to try and make sure that they're doing it well, align better, purposeful. So that's been super fun too. And we got some really cool pilot programs that we're piloting in Durham that I think could have end up being really cool stuff for across the US. And then finally, uh, I think we talked a little bit. I have a book out right now. Um, again, very specifically aimed at Chambers of Commerce, Economic Development Organizations, membership organizations around five really important things that COVID taught us about quit worrying about being relevant to your members and, and embrace being essential to the community. That's basically the gist of the book. That's awesome. So a little bit of everything. Yeah, heck yeah. If you see my mute going on, it's because like all my gadgets are going haywire. So like my <laughs> headphones don't really work. And then you know, I had a Google Meet before this. So then it was like, which thing was producing audio versus like speaker <laughs> mics? Um, it's not because I'm actually having a separate conversation. So, but anyway, well, that's great. How, you know, the our chambers of commerce, I mean, the chambers of commerce have evolved over time. And I met you kind of through that you know, yep. journey. And that was a long time ago. And did you, mm -hmm. did, I guess that's always started as like an economic development in a community. Like right now, economic development, community development, community building, thinking about kind of innovation in the future of jobs and work feels like very cool and on trend. And a lot of towns are trying to think about that. And I know kind of probably through your business, you likely have a ton of leads, but it's kind of like, yeah, that's what we've always done. That's what the, you're, you know, mm -hmm. right? Is, I mean, tell yep. me about kind of how that journey like was. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, we, I talk a little bit about that in the book. You know, Chambers are, were originally started um, centuries ago, uh, 1700s actually. Um, uh, and, and they were started to provide a, a vehicle for business to have a voice in the community development work inside a community. Right, that's really all it was. Some great history of Chambers books out there will talk to you about anything major that happened in the United States along that growth trajectory over the last two or three centuries really was a result of the community collaboration convening work that Chambers did to bring the community together to talk about it and to but really have that voice of business. And, and when I say voice of business, a real voice of business from the perspective of um, business understood for a long, long time that they were only as good as the communities in which they operated, right? So they were very community civic minded focus. Over the years, I'll make a long story short, but over the years, what really started to happen is those organizations became very centric around the member, right? So it, so you have this mission of community development, but you finance that initial mission. Your operating model is to do it through this weird membership model that you convince businesses to to pay you dues so that you can help them grow their business. So the, you're, get, you're, you're helping, trying to help figure out how to help them grow their business so you can get their money while you're really doing the bigger community development work. So that mismatch between the mission and the model has been going on a long time and COVID kind of blew it up. Um, so now Chambers is, you know, the essence of the, of the, of the, of the book is really understanding 
the the we were we are we were born in the we work we've migrated to the me work uh, and it's time to come back to the we work not forgetting the me's because they're really really important but but engaging uh engaging the me's and understanding that their best investment in the chambers of commerce is around the we work the bigger community we work yeah yeah and who invented like the mission and the model, like alignment of the mission and the model? Is that, did you did you say that, or I feel like that's just so like perfect and yeah no, yeah no yeah the mission the um, mission the you know I don't know who invented the term, but you know as far as chambers are concerned, is really right from the very beginning. Uh, they were they were you will find that they are set up and they will have mission statements that basically said we are about the the civic prosperity of our community, right? Uh, and that's what they are. But but again, when the model came along and started, and by the way, it wasn't really their fault. Um, you know, this whole corporate civic engagement model went away for a while after World War II, actually World War II, when a whole bunch of small businesses started popping up and they figured out international affairs. So they no longer had to just do US work. They could go do it anywhere. So they were less interested in the local community. Uh, and at the same time, you had all these small businesses starting to pop up, mostly through veterans assistance through World War II. And so it's a really interesting dynamic that goes on. But right now it is um, it is coming, as Chambers of Commerce are, and economic development organizations are really back to recognizing the roots, getting back to that bigger we, how do we engage in work that's really going to make a bigger, bigger collective impact in our community, um, rather than worrying about making sure I get a whole bunch of little businesses the opportunity to come to come to some sort of event and hope that they connect with each other and maybe do business. So does your work now consult with chambers or just consult directly with communities? Both, both. I work both. What I find a lot is. Um, especially this time, there's a lot of uh, communities, there's a lot of, there's two things going on. There's a lot of mergers going on between chambers and economic development organizations who are often separate organizations and communities are coming together now. That's forcing that conversation around, quite frankly, that we work um, more. And then secondly, communities, communities, might, it's just every community on the face of the sun when COVID hit, had to rely on their institutional organizations inside the communities to really help address these issues. And Chambers of Commerce have really been forefront in that. And it really started getting them actively engaged with their local community in this work. Um, and, and a lot of it is ecosystem work. Um, I happen to think this is just, I happen to think the single biggest thing that these organizations could be playing in right now, should be thinking about right now is reimagining their small business ecosystems. Number one, issue with COVID is going to be what small businesses survive. And the ecosystem they were in before has pretty much been shot to hell. And uh, chambers and economic development community organizations really got to start thinking about how do we create this, reimagine an ecosystem that really dynamically and robustly supports small businesses. Yep. Well, I want to ask you, like, how, what is the future of that? But first, I'll kind of just comment, which is funny how so many people are out there doing their work that they care about. And it, like, it kind of seems like maybe it's specific. Like, I don't really know anyone else that consults with like kind of communities and specifically chambers and has such a like depth of the histories of like chambers and all that and their relationships to the communities and the business community. But like at the end of the day, you're still just trying to like make the world a better place. Yep. And so I don't know if that's just like, it's a Friday, let's make the world a better place, man. But <laughs> you know, cause like, yeah, I mean, a happier and a more thriving community, healthy relationships between businesses and citizens and employees mm -hmm. and uh, municipalities is just all good. Like, I, I can't remember if you still like, I feel like you were like maybe consulting with like Fort Wayne or something. Yeah, the, yeah. Like, Court Wayne's projects, Fort Wayne, by the way. And this, this place, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, all, we all want it, right? It's just not just yeah, like we all a, want it. only proprietary to like really communities that have like cool coffee shops. Like everyone mm -hmm. wants. Kind everybody of wants it. You're, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, actually, is, so actually, comments on I that would, are also, but then segue into like, all right, but how, what are you prompting people with without giving away special sauce about like yeah. ecosystem, like reimagining or reimagining? Yeah. Yeah. So, if you, you know, to, to take what it is you're just saying, you're absolutely right. The everybody wants it, but the tension, I think to people the work that we're the, the tension that chambers are feeling are no different than the tension that you're we're a microcosm of what's going on nationally so the the whole last let's just say six months rather than four years that we lived through right um in the united states it really was 
a battle between the we and the me, right? It's a what's good for the nation versus what's good for me, right? Chambers of Commerce are no different. And they, they got caught up in that. Uh, local economic development organizations got caught up in that. And I think what most of them are, have done as a result of it is they've figured out that, okay, we really need to get uh, engaged in the way more engaged in the we work. It, it's, it's really critically important to the overall um, not just health and safety and prosperity, but just unity of a community and like thinking forward together collectively as a we moving forward. So it's really, uh, I think, kind of interesting. Special sauce works, there, there really isn't any special sauce. If I learned nothing working in Durham, North Carolina is that you have to be authentic. It has to be really about who your authentic community is. Let's just, now there's a lot of lessons learned. Uh, in the work that I do that I can share with other organizations. Their execution has to be really authentic to them. A good example is Fort Wayne. You know, Fort Wayne came to Durham to study Durham back when I was president of the Chamber of Commerce because they had hired a consultant to look at who was actually growing and using what we refer to in the industry as place-based economic development to grow their community. Uh, Fort Wayne had been losing population and the only, it's barely staying alive with bursts over deaths for 25 years um, when they came here. And um, they were, and what, why, why I connected with them so quickly was that they physically connected to the, the presence of Durham. It was very similar to Fort Wayne and not the least of which was a large GE facility uh, old big brick monstrosity, just like American Tobacco, sitting in right downtown um, of Fort Wayne, and and they saw what made uh, what um, Durham had done with a lot of these projects and started, what they could start to visualize in their head what that meant. Now they went way further than that. They have a river that runs through the southern end of downtown, and they they've done a riverscape. They're doing some great projects. They they identified five projects. Um, through some work uh, and uh, have all five of them going, have been killing it. Um, the last one was the GE facility. That was a tough one for them to get. You can imagine, Nick, to try and get investor dollars in Fort Wayne for a project like that. Um, took a while, uh, but luckily they were, they just closed on it um, about a month ago. Um, I raised 280 million uh, and are going to go off and do that project now. So mm. it, it's it's learning that. It's learning like, it, what I help them understand is what is authentically you. Um, you know, one of the, I use the word vibe all the time. I, I, if I learn again, it's what is the vibe of the community? What what is what feels right? J just needs to be uh, more aligned, a little more robust, a little uh, seen through maybe a different lens, and then you know, kind of talk through what that means and where you can go with it. How have things been for you to build your kind of business during COVID? Yeah. Uh, actually, it's um, uh, uh, it's been challenging more so to focus than to grow the business. It's like I, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm 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 60 weeks away from being 65 years old. I, I, I am I have no intention to work more, more than the next five years. I'm not looking to scale my business to the point where I'm a multi-million dollar business. I love the work I do and I love doing it. So for me, it's been um, the challenge has been really just being able to figure out what it what about what it is I do that I really love that I want to really focus in on and and do that piece of the work. And then here's just reality. Uh, chambers are, there are chambers that have figured COVID out and are, have, have cash and there are big, and there are chambers that are like small businesses barely surviving. And they certainly want to have conversations in communities, but they're just, they're, they can't. Yep. Well, that's interesting. And well, cause I was just kind of thinking like, this is why well, I had two thoughts before I said that third thing. One was, man, I have a great idea um, uh, that you just gave me. And then the second was, this is exactly why I wanted to do this podcast was because I love talking to people and like kind of just sharing different stories and like hearing that I just wouldn't have thought about that until this. And like, there's just kind of always these little collisions of good ideas and yeah. overlaps. And then the third was like, wait, I'm having a hard time growing my network because you know, that, that, that accidental collision or just like showing up at a, you know, a pitch day and meeting like yep. five or six other entrepreneurs who are promising, like just isn't happening. And I'm not interested in like going so far out of my way to like make it happen because it's not convenient or it's video and it's clunky 
yep. or it's just like I, I, we're taking enough risks as doing like trying to do our bare essentials let's kind of like not like add add way too much to our plate um and this mm -hmm. is like sort of in time of covid which i we will not be out of by the time of this publishing um <laughs> so all that said was yeah i mean i totally understand that My, the idea was like yeah i mean i you know so i work with or i've been working with a couple like real estate developers who you know there's something that's a trend there too like making yeah. a building into a, a place right a making place. It into something mm -hmm. and it's not one size fits all it's sort of like right. what's native to the community. It's totally separate. I read the sales book at the beginning of the year called Challenger Sales. And it's like, you kind of have your main deck and then it's about tailoring. It's like, mm -hmm. everyone's always tailoring to like some specific needs. And if you're not, it's sort of like pointless, right? But I, I, right. And then I was like, man, this would be a great collaboration with you because one of my ideas around how to add value to a project was like, what's actually inherently native to that, that market? And the one, the kind of thing in question was in the Southeast, but it wasn't here in the triangle. Right. So I was like, I think they're good at this, but like, man, I should go down there and investigate. I'm not like a developer. I'm not, I'm probably not even investing. I might invest my time into making this maybe a success. And I hope to get something in reward for that. Uh, but um, it's not my main business, but it really was. So that's interesting how those play together. So yep. I think it's almost like, you know, people, if they're thinking about Casey, might be thinking too narrowly if it's just about sort of the chamber, right? The chamber mm -hmm. is a function in overall kind of community development and community mm -hmm. leadership. Um, so that's interesting. And, and yeah, I yeah, it, it is. And I, I would say to you, Nick, that that is, um, it, it, it is all about collaboration. I, I, like I'll give you the Fort Wayne project, the Fort Wayne project that just weighed, uh, raised $280 million came from somebody I introduced them to here in Durham when they were visiting in Durham. <laughs> he, he, matter of fact, I was in Fort Wayne. My daughter, by the way, my youngest. Oh, daughter. that's right. I knew I saw the guy who bought. That. I was like, what? How? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like, I met the lady too. You introduced me. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, yep, yep. yeah. They, they, yep, they were here, uh, and I introduced them to. And I'm in. By the way, my youngest daughter lives in Fort Wayne. Her husband is a family is from Fort Wayne. They moved back there, so I was just up there for three weeks of visiting uh, with my grandkids and having a good time. And um, they, they were all, and like, they were all texting me and having no idea I was there uh, because I wasn't, they didn't, I didn't really want to go out, but a lot of the people were, because they were very excited that they had closed the project. Uh, and one of the guys I'm texting with is a guy from Durham that, you know, was like, you know, this project wouldn't happen without you. And I'm like, all I did was make, to the point you were making earlier, all I did was make the connection and help them see the opportunities, right? I don't do the project. I don't engage in the project. It, for me, it's just helping everybody. I think what I think what I would say to you, my secret sauce is, is that I can translate. <laughs> I, I can I can go into a community. I can hear the conversation. I can take all of these crazy ass things that are going around in my brain, and I can I can spit out and translate for them. Okay, here's some things I think you ought to consider, and and I can say it in a way when I say translate. I can say it in a way that I'm speaking to their truth. So they immediately connect with it and go, oh, yeah, 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 I get that. So I'm not trying to tell them something like do it this way. I'm trying to say, here's here, in my experience, what I'm hearing you say is you're going to here is my recommendation for the things that you should be looking at. And in a way that's speaking their language and they get it and they kind of like go from there. So I, I think that's to the point you were making. How do you like? make the connections and stuff. It is just constant conversations with people. You just, you, I'm a big believer in ser ser intentional serendipity. That it, it is, there is someone out there on everything all of the time. Yep. How, so how big was that facility? Was it like a million square feet? Yes, yeah, million like square feet. Like mm -hmm. how many acres, like oh, across on like eight or 10? Uh, I don't remember the acreage, tell you the honest God truth. The reason yeah. I say that is because that project was just really one. They did actually did five. They did big development around their ballpark. They have a beautiful ball, minor league ballpark like we do. Um, they have, they did the riverfront project. They did a uh, STEM, a uh, new STEM facility. They, they did a bunch of projects. I would also say to you, absolutely spearheaded by the state of Indiana who created um, how, who created some financing initiatives that would actually uh, encourage this kind of activity. Yep. Uh, and so uh, they did they did a lot a lot of you just it's an amazing thing. It's also interesting, Nick, I don't know if you work when you work outside of North Carolina or where you're from. The Midwest, that area is always fascinating to me because, one of the hardest parts for me to get them wrapping their head around is that they, that that size project wasn't to, 
to be, to, to think about doing what it is they wanted to do to them was an audacious act. And audacious, bold equates with arrogance. Like they are just good enough. Like this is how we, this is how we, uh, good enough. Don't be too bold. Don't be too crazy. So getting them comfortable with bold, whew, was, a, was a really interesting cultural thing that I've never done before. Yep. I'm actually from Indianapolis. And so Are you? In my, in, which is in Indiana, of course, but uh, like, yeah, I have a lot of, I mean, not, I mean, I know like all the towns through soccer and basketball sports, you know, you go to like little, right. other, you go to other high school, mostly basketball, you go to high schools and their gyms and then soccer, you just, you know, know kids from other high schools and you kind of travel around, but, um, and then Fort Wayne was kind of quasi en route to Chicago. Um, but yeah, and, and actually one of our high school soccer rival teams was up there and it was okay. called Fort Wayne Canterbury. It was like a nice private school, I think. Um, but uh, so, yeah, well, that's interesting. So I almost like had this thought that kind of almost runs counter to the mission and model sort of statement that we made before, which is like, you know, we want to like provide civic whatever, but then we charge the businesses and that's counter. Yep. But there is something like, kind of like to the, so, and I hate, I don't like always like, not everything's not a peg. And then I have this like blockchain hammer, but there's sort of like a model, like what, what, what sort of like the tokenomics and thing has sort of created, and I'm not even really an expert, is kind of this, you know, it's like it's like decentralization, but it's kind of like new economic paradigms and, and mm -hmm. tokens or securities, whatever, maybe I'm not a securities lawyer either, around things that otherwise kind of aren't encouraged to happen, right? So if I'm mm -hmm. a business, I should be encouraged to put some money in or yep. stake the community so that if the community thrives, I get a reward, which now you pay your membership and then you hope to get clients or you hope that there's enough citizens that go to your restaurant, which right. feels weird. Cause you're like, but I'm also actually getting the money by, cause I made them their sandwich and provided great service. And right. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. So right. But like, there's not nothing again, you know, it's yeah. in the building, like you intro the building guy and did that. And like, and, and they, and even as I'm thinking about the project we might collaborate on with it, which is a real estate related, all these people are sort of independently motivated to, do the thing that gets the project done how do we make it so we have actually a shared motivation and actually are like contractually bound via like a smart contract or a token or we have the same yep. token uh for that outcome to happen so like the state put in the incentive private money put in that capital a bank or mm -hmm. other investors put in the other capital users will become tenants customers retail will come shop like how do we create i mean that i'm really interested in like how does that actually we have a way that we actually all like kind of invest into that outcome up front. And it's not just like, we're all waiting and seeing like, I can't spend the money until the state authorizes this. The state can't authorize it until they see a commitment and the, the commitment can't happen until you get these investors on a hope and a faith. Like maybe we could make this all way easier and it doesn't have to be blockchain at all related, but I wonder if there's like some process innovation where instead of you just being this, like I'm Casey, I connect all these dots and then magic <laughs> happens. like it, it's yeah. more systematic. I, I, I mean, there's two things I want to say to that because I, that you, you, I agree 100% with you. First, I will say to you that what a lot of organizations used to do, went away from, and are back to communities used to do, are back from, is really strong community foundations. So they create a community foundation um, or a chamber foundation that has a community plan around. Right. And then they gather investment into that. That lets them start that work so that they can, if you think about it, as the initial first round of investment. Right. So as you can start getting that work and do that work. A really good example of that, actually, uh, Nick, was back in the day uh, in Durham uh, when we did the things that we did uh, around the entrepreneurial ecosystem. We did that. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce side of the work that we did in that was really financed through our community foundation, our chamber foundation work. So we went to the IBMs of the world, for example, and said, this investment is for uh, in this work, you, you funding our being able to play and fund and resource this work really is a longer term investment, uh, is a short term investment for you on, um, on good PR and infrastructure work, but it's a great long term investment in talent. Um, the more we're able, because the more we're able to pursue entrepreneurship, the more incredible creative talent um, there is going to be, uh, especially in Durham, around technology 
that's going to support your initiatives and support your need for talent pool and what it is that you need to do. And that's how we finance it a lot. Large amounts of money from corporations who saw it as seed capital for a better community that also met their need. Right. So from that perspective, I think true community stuff uh, really works. Having said that, I will also tell you the biggest fallback that chambers of commerce and, and organizations like that have is that Nick, they still believe that they, they own and command and control their own brand. Right. Like I'm the, I'm the keeper of the brand of Durham and helping them understand, uh, no, you're not. <laughs> we live in a world in which you know, people come to, well, before people come to Durham or discover Durham, they found it through 50 other channels that have nothing to do with you, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and, and engaging, so part of the book that I wrote and part of what I'm trying to do is help them understand how to create this collective impact of we in a community and, and engage the, a, a larger, uh, larger voices who, who are important and critical to what the work that's being done, but who are never giving never invited to the table nor given the microphone, right? So how do we, how do we create a real shared uh, uh, work of, of prosperity? And then the last thing I would say to you, I have always felt the one of the things that Durham did especially well that I've not seen in a lot of other places is, is our ability to connect at a ground, ground street level. Um, I tell people all the time, most communities I go in have a very uh, vertical hierarchy to them, right? Either you're born or you move into them over time, you you get enough clout that you can actually matter in conversations and connections. Durham is one of those places you could be walking down the street and, and, and meet two people and before you get to the street corner, you got the mayor's cell phone number. I mean, that's just how we, but, but to the point you were making, we, it, it, it stays within a few block area. We have never figured out how to take that flat connection work that we do and disperse it through the community. There are wholesale parts of Durham that have not, do not have access to that flat connection web we've created in Durham. That I think if you were able to do that, man, you talk about some of the things that you could do to have a community really invest in and be part of and um, have some incredibly creative things that could be going on all over the city. Absolutely. It's, we've not figured out that infrastructure. So you have the mayor's cell phone number. Can you just say that out loud? I do have a mayor's cell phone number. <laughs> I need it, man. I need to hit that guy up. <laughs> uh, just kidding, I don't. But yeah, so, um, but, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I wonder, so how, like, go back to what you're saying about the, the work you're doing is around sort of the reimagination yep. uh, of these. We just kind of talked about these kind of different things that are modes or, or tactics or sort of like structures my thought was like, you know, even if you focus it on a project, that project could be its own unique, you know, that could be the, the structure or the, mm -hmm. the protocol that then brings all these parties together. Yep, absolutely. You know, it's not like you have to force everyone to join something first and then like all things are decentralized community decisions or whatever. So you can I would agree, but the, the only nuance I would say to that is the rest of the community needs to know they will eventually be in, invited or do have a voice in it. Um, because they will not participate later on when you invite them in if they felt excluded in the beginning. No, I've learned that through. So yeah. you don't have to engage them right from the, you know, at the table right from the beginning, but you have to make it clear that there will be a, an eventual lane. That's right. No, that's a great, that's a great clarification. I, I, like, so wh what would you take away? I mean, what are your, like, I'm just trying to think of how do we kind of get to a place where we have some actionable ideas around, you know, for people trying to re-envision, you know, the community. Do you, I mean, is it like sort of like project-based, like getting them to pick a project and go, or is it to, you know, you you know I, I, yeah. I really think it all depends on the community. Um, it can be uh, a lot of communities. We, we are, um, we are blessed you and I, Nick, to live in Durham and live in the Research Triangle Park where there's a lot of infrastructure already in place. So it can be project-based and then you tap into the infrastructure in the community to work on that project. There are lots of communities that don't have the infrastructure. You know, they, they just don't, they don't even have, if you wanted to do a project, you wouldn't know where to go to to tap into <laughs> uh, to do something. So it, I wish I could tell you, here is the example, here's the model, but it, it really, um, it really depends on it. I will say this, I would say if I was playing in this space, I would be playing in what I call, you know, tertiary cities, not primary cities. I'd be playing in the people um, in, in, the, in the kind of communities that um, are secondary communities, 
have enough infrastructure already in place that you can build on it and are starting to become once again, um, uh, magnets for talent who are leaving major metropolitan areas as a result of COVID. People are not, what, what I want to say to people, you read in the headlines a lot, oh, people are leaving Brooklyn and in, in, in Manhattan in large numbers. That's true, they are, but they are not going to Podunk, Wyoming. Um, they're, they're going to, you know, Durham's and Nashville's and Chattanooga's and uh, you know, uh, Birmingham's and places like that. They're still, they're going to tertiary secondary level communities because they still can get what they value um, out of a major metropolitan area, it just at a lower level. Um, and I think if, if you think about tertiary communities, there is where you can really be creative. There is really where you could, they're hungrier. Um, they have enough beginning infrastructure um, to play with. Uh, but, but you can, you know, really quickly get into some fun projects. Yep. And tertiary is not the names you mentioned, or is tertiary the podunk Wyoming? Yeah. You know, yeah. Tertiary is the Durham's of the world. The okay. secondary, the second tier level cities. Like for instance, if you look at Durham, we'll never make major metropolitan areas. You know, we make the next level down 500, think, think 500,000 and less ish people. Yep. And, and who, so what's the opportunity though? And, and who's it for? Uh, I think it's for, well, let me, let me say this. I keep talking about people moving in town. Understand that the currency of today in any community is talent. It is what drives prosperity everywhere. Now, some, some use their talent, some don't. Some know, understand that others don't. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when you were doing economic development, you, you were convincing a factory to move into your community because the water was cheap, the land was cheap. And quite frankly, you had a great talent, talented blue collar workforce that were affordable. Um, and so basically what would happen is a company would come, would find those assets, move in, and then talent would come to them. Total opposite, 180 degrees now. Um, today, companies, when they're trying to decide where to look, the number one thing by far, like second is way down, <laughs> uh, is what is the current talent in that community that's going to help me open my business and, and um, keep my business up and running? And how does it match my, how does that talent match my needs? So that is why Chambers of Commerce Economic Development Organizations play in place-based activities because place-based matters to talent. Talent decides where they're going to live first then where they're going to work. Uh, and so they decide where they're going to live more and more and more based upon uh, amenities that matter to them and vibe that matters to them and culture that matters to them, the kind of culture that's in a community that, that they want to be part of. And so, uh, so that is why I think uh, it, it, ter secondary communities matter because they, they are very attractive to talent. And whether it's talent, you have the opportunity to do a lot of cool things. Yep. What about the, I was, I was trying to think of, you know, what's the other player in that, right? It's like, it's, it's opportunities to not only, I mean, the talent might just go there, but why are they going there and what are they going to do when they're there? But how does someone then take advantage of that infrastructure that that town is trying to create, which is culture, good, you know, vibes and mm -hmm. talent now coming there, starting, maybe bringing their remote job, but yep. you know, what, how did, what's the, what are the little, what are the opportunities there or what needs to happen to, to fulfill that whole. You, the, uh, and, and, you know, that's a really good point, which is that now you're getting to the reimagine, right? To the reimagine then is what is the ecosystem that you're creating so that if I am uh, a Nick Jordan in a community like that, how do I tap into that going on and make sure that I am number one, part of it. And number two, uh, growing as a result of it, you're taking advantage of it, not in a negative way, but in a positive way, you know? Um, and I think that is where the communities nowadays, so very traditional, uh, you know, ecosystems have been very traditional ecosystems where you, you know, you move in, you move, you, uh, you get to know some people, you might join the Chamber of Commerce, you find a banker, um, you talk to your neighbors of, of, about, you know, what school system your kids could, could go to and you, and you start to engage in that kind of stuff. What, it, it's, it's not an easy path. It, there's no one path, but there's also no, what I refer to as, there's also no journey map. 
<laughs> what communities need to do, and, and some of the ones I've been working on are how do we create, how do we reinvent the small business ecosystem that makes it very clear, easy, and supportive and inclusive of the, of the, of the larger uh, community at large, and how do we make that journey easier? Uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we put up a map um, on a, on a web page that says, Hey, you interested? Welcome. Welcome. You interested in starting a business? You're interested in connecting to a business. Here are the five stops along the way you have got to make. And here are the people that you've got to introduce yourself to. And those people have to be willing to be listed. And those people have to be willing to be part of the connection process. And we have, I have communities that are busy trying to figure that out right now. 